All right, so here we go. This is question number 10. It comes straight out of our um, slides that I had posted to Canvas from the get-go. And before I wrote maybe, and now we have time and we're gonna come back and we're gonna try and solve this problem. So it says, you take 7.24 grams of IBR, you put it in a container. They tell you the volume of that container. It's 0.225 liters and you heat it up to 500 Kelvin. It says at this temperature, the following reaction takes place. So they give us a beautiful balanced equation. And it says the measured pressure of bromine at equilibrium of BR2 is 3.01 atmospheres. Find the value of Kp and Kc. Okay, well, let's see here. If we are starting out, and I'm just trying to think here, um, the first thing that we would want to do is we would want to figure out what the pressure of the IBR is, okay? Now, how would we figure out the pressure of the IBR? Well, if we're starting it with 7.24 grams of IBR, this is where we're starting, right? This is initially, it's all we have, okay? Um, we want to figure out the pressure of that IBR. Now, if you're wondering, like, Mr. Dion, how am I going to figure out the pressure of the IBR when I have its mass and I have the volume and I have the temperature? Well, we're going to use an old chestnut from General Chemistry 1. So we have to remember our general chemistry, and you should remember the formula PV is equal to nRT. So we can solve for the pressure of the IBR. No, not IBB, IBR, which is going to be equal to NRT divided by V. We have the number of grams of IBR, and we can solve for the number of moles of IBR. Now, of course, you're going to have a periodic table at your disposal. So if you want to figure out the number of moles, the number of moles of IBR, and again, it's going to be equal to 7.24 grams divided by the molar mass of IBR. Again, I've gone ahead and done that already. It's 206.81 grams per mole. And I'm just doing this on the side here. And you end up with 0, 0 0.0350 moles. So that's how much IBR you're starting with. So you're starting with 0 0.0350 moles. So let's plug some numbers into our um, ideal gas formula. So we have 0 0.0350 moles of our IBR multiplied by the gas constant, 0 0.082. 06 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin multiplied by the temperature in Kelvin, which is 500 K. And we divide all of that by the volume of the container, which is 0 0.225 liters. Let's check our units. Moles cancel, liters cancel, and temperature in Kelvin cancels. And we're left over with the pressure in atmospheres. Okay. Remember, everything in this formula is a gas, okay? A gas has a mass, doesn't it? So even though they're telling us it's 7.24 grams of a sample of IBR, it might be a knee-jerk reaction for you to, you to say, well, it's 7.24 grams, so it must be a solid. Well, that's not necessarily true. We can weigh a solid. We can weigh a liquid. We can weigh a gas. So it's 7.24 grams of a gas. And now we're going to figure out the pressure. And the reason why I want to figure out the pressure is because all they're telling us is the pressure of the bromine, the Br2, at equilibrium. And then we're going to put these in a nice table, and then hopefully it will crystallize in our mind and become a little clearer. So we get the pressure of our IBR, and this is all we're starting out with, is equal to 6.38 atmospheres. Now we've kind of done the hard part. Now we can start plugging in some numbers into our ice table. So let's rewrite the equation. We have iodine plus BR2 is in equilibrium with our IBR. Everything is in the gas phase, the iodine, the bromine, and the IBR. Initially, what do we start with? We don't have any iodine. We don't have any bromine, but we've got 6.38 atmospheres of IBR. Then some kind of change occurs. Now, here's where you have to apply Le Chatelier's principle. If we start it with only IBR and no 
reactants. Could anybody tell me which way is the equilibrium going to shift? Towards the left, reactants, or towards the right, products? You're going to make some products. <laughs> no, we're going to make reactants because all we have are products, right? This is the product. Oh, Anything right. on the right-hand side is a product. So we're going to shift towards the left to make reactants. We have no reactants. We're only starting with the product from our balanced equation. Okay, so if we're going to shift to the left-hand side, that means we're going to end up losing IBR. Now, I didn't balance out my equation, so I'll have to fix it. Let me just move that over. Here we go. So I should have a 2 in front of my IBR. Let me get it there. Okay. So that means when my change occurs, when I shift to the left, I'm going to lose 2x here, but I'm going to gain x for both of these. Right? Why is it losing two times as much? Because there's twice as much IBR in the balanced equation as there is moles of iodine or bromine. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you understand what I just said. This is a thumbs up, okay? If you understand that section the subtract 2x and the add 2x okay again it's all related to stoichiometric coefficients one one and two so again if i'm losing 2x i'm going to gain only 1x for both my iodine and bromine respectively okay so that means at equilibrium we're going to have x here we're going to have X here, and we're going to have 6.38 ATM minus 2X. Now, what other information have they told us? They told us that actually equilibrium, the pressure of the bromine, the Br2, is actually 3.01 atmospheres. Look at the math. If I have 0 plus X, and X is equal to 3.01, what is X equal? X equals... 3.01 atmospheres. So that means I'm going to have 3.01 atmospheres of my iodine, and I'm going to have 6.38 subtract 2 times 3.01 atmospheres for my IBR, which equals, and I've done this already, I can't read my writing. Let me grab a calculator. Oh, where's a calculator in this room? Here we go. Oh, they're on the floor next to the drill. Makes total sense, right? Okay. My office is a real mess. I'm trying to renovate it right now. Okay, so I have, uh, let's see, 6.38 subtract 2 times 3.01. I guess I could have done that in my head. Anyhow, you end up with 0 0.36 atmospheres. So 0 0.36 atmospheres. So at equilibrium, we have 3.01 atmospheres of iodine. 3.01 atmospheres of bromine, and we have only 0 0.36 atmospheres of our IBR. We're asked to determine Kp and Kc. Let's start by determining Kp because we know that Kp is going to be equal to the pressure of IBR squared divided by the pressure of I2 times the pressure of Br2. So that's going to be equal to 0 0.36 squared divided by 3.01 squared, right? Because both of these have the same pressure, so I'm just squaring them. When you put 0.36 squared in your calculator and you divide that by 3.01 squared, it equals 0 0.0143. Um, I'll put an extra sig fig in there. Anyhow, so hold on, let me see, 0.36. Technically, there should only be two sig figs here, but whatever. We'll just call it that for now. Anyhow, that's our Kp. Again, technically, it should be 0 0.014, but we'll just use that. So we figured out Kp, and the last thing that we have to do is determine Kc. In order to do that, we're going to use the formula that Kp is equal to Kc times Rt to the delta n. We're going to isolate Kc, which is going to be equal to Kp divided by Rt to the power of delta n. We get the Kc, nope, Kc is equal to 0 0.0143 divided by um, 
8.314, different gas constant, right? Times the temperature, which is 500 K to the delta N. Could anybody tell me what delta N is in this one? What's my delta N in this reaction? Exactly. My delta N, delta N is equal to zero, right? Delta N is equal to two moles of gas subtract two moles of gas, which equals zero. So this is to the power of zero. So that means that KC is going to be equal to 0 0.0143. So in this case, since there's no changes in the number of moles of gas, this is an example where KC is equal to KP since delta N is equal to zero. No, you don't change the KP equation, right? When you're looking at the equation that you're given, Brogan, this is what we're using for our ice table. We report or we write down the equilibrium constant formula, whether it's KP or KC, as the products to the power of their stoichiometric coefficients divided by the reactants to the power of their stoichiometric coefficients. All right, here we go. Give me a thumbs up if that helps you a little bit. There's a lot to think about in this problem. But we have to analyze everything. So, you know, I was talking to Dr. Diaz about this, you know, class yesterday, and I see he, because he's teaching it as well in the online, um, uh, completely online. And I said, you know, we we're talking about chapter 13, and he said, you know, make sure you go over plenty of problems because. You know, students have to learn that you kind of have to apply a lot of your general chemistry knowledge to be able to solve these problems. You really got to be sort of Johnny on the spot to solve problems in uh, the equilibria chapter. Well, let's move ahead to question 13. And again, this is one I skipped before I said skip this one. And the reason I said it is because the reason I said skip it, I went back and looked and there was a mistake in my solution that I had posted. And whenever I make a mistake in a solution, I'm like, that doesn't seem like fun to do that. So I fixed it. It is fixed. Uh, if you go on to um, um, Canvas and look at the solution, it should be perfectly fine now. Okay, there's nothing wrong with it. It's all squared away. Anyhow, yeah, so let's try number 12. It says, let's imagine we're on our, our next exam. It says the equilibrium constant Kp for this reaction. You can see that everything is in the gaseous phase is 4.5 is 600 degrees Celsius. A quantity of SO3 gas was placed in a one liter reaction vessel at 600 degrees, when the system reached equilibrium, the vessel was found to contain two moles of oxygen of O2. What amount of SO3 gas was originally placed in the reaction vessel? Well, let's write down what we know just to kind of put that down here. So we know that Kc, or is it Kp? No, Kc is equal to 4.5 at um, T is equal to 600. 600 Celsius, so what would that be? 873 Kelvin. Anyhow, so we know that. Let's write down our balanced equation. We have 2SO2 in the gaseous phase plus oxygen in the gaseous phase, which produces two moles of SO3 in the gaseous phase. And we know that initially it says, I love this, a quantity, right? Where's my highlighter? A quantity of SO3 gas was put in the container. So that means we're starting out with Y. Okay, I'm gonna call it Y because I like to use X for my change. Okay, so we're starting it with just a quantity of SO3 and we don't have any SO2, sulfur dioxide, and we don't have any oxygen. That's where we're starting. Okay, that's where we're starting. Then we undergo some kind of change. Now, let's use our understanding of Le Chatelier's principle to determine who's losing X and who's gaining X. All right, if the Kp, or sorry, the Kc is 4.5, that tells us that we must have some reactants. So for my sulfur trioxide, my SO3, would I put sub subtract 2x or plus 2x? If you apply Le Chatelier's principle to what we have so far initially. Plus two. Mm, I don't think so. It's going to be subtract 2x. Okay. We're going to put subtract 2x here. All right. Let's back up for a second if you don't understand or if you don't follow me. Look, the Kc is equal to concentration of SO3 squared 
divided by concentration of SO2 squared multiplied by O2. If the Kc is equal to 4.5, right? What, what over what equals 4.5? That means I have to have a big number over a smaller number in order to equal a number greater than one, right? So that means I'm gonna have to have some products, but I'm also gonna have to have some reactants. Here I have nothing. I have zero of those, so I have to make some of those. So that means I have to make some of this and I have to make some of this. If I need to make these, I'm gonna consume some of this. Now I'm just approaching it from a different way, right? You could also say, okay, here's my initial state. I'm gonna box it in in green. I've got none of the reactants. I've only got some of the product. So the reaction is gonna have to shift towards the left, right? If it shifts towards the left, I have to add this and I have to remove that. Does that make sense? All right, to equal 4.5, I can't have a number, I can't have some kind of number x divided by zero, All right? If you take any number, nine divided by zero, it gives you an error because it equals infinity, okay? All right, well, hopefully that'll clear it up a little bit. Let me just erase some of this chicken scratch here. Okay, so. Now that we've got all that, we can write down what we have at equilibrium. Here we've got 2x, here we've got x, and here we've got y, the, the quantity, minus 2x. Okay, but it tells you something else at equilibrium. It tells you that at equilibrium, you have two moles of oxygen. It tells you that right here, you've got 2.0 moles of oxygen. That tells you that if you have zero plus x, and x is or you, then you end up with two moles, that tells you that x must equal 2.0 moles. If we have two times x over here, that means we must have two times 2.0 moles, which is gonna equal 4.0 moles. Okay, if we have y minus 2x, okay, that's gonna be equal to y minus two times two, so it's gonna be y minus 4.0 moles. But in order for us to start trying to solve for y using this expression, we have to have these written in concentrations, right? This is concentration of the reactants and products, not the number of moles. Now that we've got the number of moles and we also have the volume, which is one liter, the math is pretty easy. You take all these, you divide by 1.00 liters, divide by 1.00 liters, divide by 1.00 liters. What do you get? Just thinking here, just for one second. Yeah, you end up with, at equilibrium, you have 4.0 molar of sulfur dioxide, you have 2.0 molar of oxygen, and you have Y minus 4.0 molar of your sulfur trioxide. Now you can plug these values into the equilibrium constant expression. So you can say your Kc, which is equal to 4.5, 4.5 is equal to y minus 4.0. I'm going to leave the units out, okay, squared, divided by 4.0 squared times 2, 2.0, like that, okay? So you can see that we're going to have to solve a polynomial here, right? There's no escaping it. All right, well, how would we do that? Well, we're going to multiply everything out. And when I did that, I got something that looked like this. I got 144. So if you take four and you square it, multiply by two, multiply by 4.5, you get 144 is equal to y squared minus 8.0 y squared, or sorry, minus 8.0 y um, plus 16, like that, okay? Then you solve that for zero and you get that zero is equal to y squared minus 8.0y minus 128. That is your polynomial expression. Oops. And now you need to solve that for y. So I'm going to break out the old TI. Somebody asked me what it was the other day. It's a TI um, 36X Pro. Okay, you could Google that. It's not an expensive you know, uh, calculator. Or you can solve the quadratic. If you just like to solve quadratics, be my guest. Either way works. There's nothing wrong with solving a quadratic. 
but I'm going to plug in all those numbers in the polynomial function. So I have my A is equal to one. I have my B is equal to negative eight. And I have my C is equal to, sorry, I can't see here, negative 128. And then I solve and I get that X1 is equal to negative eight. That's not correct. So I get that Y is equal to 16. So 16 molar is what Y must be equal to. So if we want to figure out the quantity that was originally in there in moles, I'm going to take the concentration, 16 moles per liter. But again, I'm trying to figure out the number of moles of SO3. It's going to be 16 moles per liter times my 1.00 liter vessel. And I end up with 16 moles of SO3 is what I started out with. I have a question, if that's Go okay. Go for it. So, um... In our uh, ice table, we have y minus 4.0. Would we not subtract that to figure that out, or would you use the original y? Um, no, because you solved for y in the polynomial, right? You're not asked for the amount of SO3 at equilibrium. It's asking you, what's the amount of SO3 gas that was originally Right, originally would be initially, what was initially placed in the reaction vessel. So that's what you're solving for here. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, no problem. All right, and if you wanna check it, I mean, so what this student is asking, you know, um, that could, I mean, we could check it if we want, you know, um, let me get a different font or a different color here, sorry. Uh, let's see, is there room to check it here? We could just say 4.5, and I'm just doing some mental math here. So if you had um, 16 minus 4, what's 16 minus 4? 12, right? So we would have, come on, you'd have 12 squared divided by um, 4 squared, 4 squared times 2. I'm just doing some quick and dirty math here. So if you grab a calculator, you take um, 144 divided by 32, right? So that equals 4.5. So it all checks out. So this is our check. Okay. All right. There you go. So it all worked out. Everything worked out in the end. Okay. There you go. So number 12. All right. Who wants to try another one? I do. Let's go for it. Let's try that. Um, let's try number 15. Just give me a second here to get set up. I got to find the question. So we solved this one, right? We solved that one. But we this one later. <laughs> Let's go to later. I'll give you a second to read over the problem and I'll find my notes. I like to make notes about everything. All right. You're probably discovering by now that chemistry 1411 requires a lot of calculator, pencil, and paper. Right? Just it just it just does, you know, there's no way around it. Virtually all these problems take, not all of them, I shouldn't say, but anything that involves an ice table, I always take up a whole sheet of paper to do it. All right, so later is now, okay? So we'll cross this out and we'll say, not later, let's do it. Let's do it now, not manana. Okay, consider the following reversible reaction. We've got a beautiful, we've got a beautiful uh, reversible reaction here. It says solid ammonium carbamate, or notice it's not carbonate, it's carbamate. So solid ammonium carbon, carbamate is added to an evacuated container at 40 degrees Celsius and allowed to reach equilibrium. At equilibrium, the total pressure of the container is 0.363 atmospheres. The temperature of the system is constant. What's Kc and what's Kp? Well, we're given, let's see here. Let's write down what we got. I always, you know, when I'm solving these problems, I always just write down everything I know. So our temperature is equal to 40.0 degrees Celsius. It's really inconsequential. 273 plus 40. So what that, what's that? 313 Kelvin, right? And then my total pressure. And that's total pressure at equilibrium. So P total is equal to 0 0.363 atmospheres. Now let's write down our balanced equation. So we have our ammonium carbamate. Notice that that is a solid, okay? So we're gonna write solid. We have our equilibrium arrows. We have two moles of ammonia. 
in the gaseous phase plus one mole of carbon dioxide in the gaseous phase. Okay, so initially, we're starting out with something. It doesn't tell us how much, and we're starting it with none of these. Okay, right, that's what it's telling us. It tells you you're taking solid ammonium carbonate, you're putting it into an evacuated container. That means there's nothing else. Okay, you have some solid ammonium carbonate. I don't know how much, some. Okay, um, and then you have none of these. So then it's going to undergo some kind of change, right? This is going to lose a certain amount. You're going to end up generating twice as much ammonia, and you're going to have plus X here. I just applied Le Chatelier's principle, right? Think about it. I have only this at the beginning, and I have none of this. So hopefully by now you're starting to get the hang of it that the equilibrium is going to have to shift towards the right. Okay? Now equilibrium, all they gave us was the total pressure. But I want you to think about this carefully. Could anybody tell me what the pressure of the solid ammonium, ammonium carbamate would be at equilibrium? What would be its pressure? What would be the pressure of the solid ammonium carbamate at equilibrium? I see Joel put up an answer. Joel, I think your answer is right. Joel, can you tell us why you put zero for the total pressure of the solid ammonium carbamate? Is it just because it's solid? Yeah, solids don't have a pressure, right? Solids do not have a pressure, so that means there's going to be no pressure here, none, okay? Somebody just asked, is total pressure the KP? No, not at all. KP is going to be equal to the constant, or sorry, the pressure, shit, since we're doing pressure, it's going to be equal to the pressure of the ammonia squared times the pressure of the carbon dioxide, All right? It's got nothing to do with total pressure, okay? So I have no pressure because it's a solid. But my equilibrium here, I have 2x here and I have x here. Okay. And I also know, again, that my P total is 3.63 atmospheres. Do you guys remember Dalton's law of partial pressures? Okay. And mole fraction? Well, if I have a mixture of gases, and these are the only two gases, the ammonia and the carbon dioxide, when I total those up, right, if I add these two together, I get 3x is going to be equal to the total pressure, right? So that means, therefore, 3x is equal to 0 0.366, not 366, 363 atmospheres. So that means that x, x is equal to 0 0.121 atmospheres. That tells me that at equilibrium, the pressure of my CO2 is 0 0.121 atmospheres, and the pressure of my ammonia is two times 0.121. If you have a dollar 21 and you double it, what do you get? Two dollars and and uh, 42 cents. So you end up with 0 0.242 242 atmospheres. Okay, you got to connect some dots between general chemistry one and general chemistry two, right? We just applied Dalton's law of partial pressures. If you have to go review Dalton's law, Dalton's law, but you should know that the sum of the pressures of gases, when you add them all up, if you want to find their individual pressures, it's going to be equal to their mole fraction. Okay, now here we don't have to use the mole fraction because we know that we have 2x and we have x, which gives us a 3x total, and we've been given that, so it's actually a little bit easier. But give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on the concept that we have the total gases, right? We started out with zero and we're able to figure out the individual pressure of each. Yes, no toaster. Okay, good. All right, so now we have the pressures of the two gases and we're asked to calculate Kp. So let's do that. We know that our Kp expression, which I wrote over here, is gonna be equal to the pressure of the ammonia, 0 0.242 squared times 0 0.121. We plug all that spinach in our calculator. Get my calculator 0.242, square it, multiply by 0.121, get a small number, scientific notation. It equals um, 7.09 times 10 to the negative 
three. So there you go. There's our KP. If we want to calculate KC, I'm not going to write down the whole, whole formula again. You guys need to know how to rearrange the formula. So KC is going to be equal to KP divided by RT to the delta N. We have our we have our KP, which is 7.09 times 10 to the negative 3. We divide that by 8.314 times our temperature. Shoot, I did. Oh, yeah, I did it. Yeah, 313 Kelvin. Could anybody tell me what delta N is in this uh, equation? And it's not a trick. Mr. Dion does not like tricks. What would delta N be here? Yeah, thanks, Sierra. Delta N is going to be three, right? We have one, two, three moles of gas total in the products, and we have zero here because ammonium carbamate is a solid. So we have our delta N. I'll just write it here. Delta N is equal to three minus zero. So delta N is equal to three. So that means we're going to cube this whole thing. We punch all that spinach into our calculator. Let me see here. This is where having like an expensive calculator helps out 0 0.00009 divided by 8.314 times 13. There we go. So you end up with 4.19 times 10 to the negative 7 is your KC. All right. So, you know, kind of connecting a few dots here. Solids don't have pressures, right? A solid is not going to exert any kind of pressure on a system. So we don't even have to consider that. Um, understanding our KP expressions, our KC expressions. All right. Well, with all that in mind, let's go to the let's go to the extra problems. And these we solved everything else. So let's go down to the end. And I put quite a few extra problems. Some of them are simple. Some of them are a little more complicated. Again, I posted the solutions to these on, um, on the interweave. Question 29. Did we do question 29? I don't remember if we did. Oh, yeah. I said we were going to do question 29. Let's do question 29. Let's back up and do this one. That way we can say that we solved every single problem in the in the slides and then after that we'll look at a couple of these problems okay start with the first one and work our way down okay who feels like they needed a practice day <laughs> day of just practicing equilibrium not a bad thing take a little bit of time to practice all right well let's give it a shot here um, number 29. So again, we didn't do this one. So let's give it the old college try. It says, consider the following reversible reaction. 2A in the gaseous phase produces B and C. Both of those are gases. It says you put 0.1 moles of A, 0.2 moles of B, and 0.2 moles of C in a 3.20 liter vessel. Calculate the concentration of each of these when equilibrium has been established. Eh, this isn't that bad of a problem, really. Um, Let's start by writing down our balanced equation. We've got 2A in the gaseous phase is in equilibria with one mole of B in the gaseous phase plus one mole of C in the gaseous phase. And it tells us that initially we start out with 0 0.100 moles of A. We've got 0 0.200 moles of B and we've got 0 0.200 moles of C. All right. It doesn't tell us that they're at equilibrium. Okay, that doesn't say that, so that means it's not at equilibrium. We know that our KC expression is equal to, you know, concentration of B times the concentration of C divided by the concentration of A squared. All right, that's our KC expression. So that means we need everything in concentrations, right? So that means we're going to have to divide all of these by the volume in order to determine what the concentrations are. So 3.20 liters for all these. So it init initially, ugh, our concentrations are, are what? We got, um, 
5.2 divided by 3.2. So let's see here. So if I take 0.2 divided by 3.2, come on. There we go. We got 0. Point, what am I doing wrong here? Da, 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 da. Two moles of this. No, so, sorry, 0. 0.1 divided by 3.2. I'm like, that doesn't look right. Okay, so here I've got 0. 0.313 molar, and here I have 0. 0.0625 molar, and here I have 0. 0.0625 molar. There we go. All right, so we have the initial I just, just Sorry to interrupt you, go but uh, the 0. 0.1 divided by 3.2 is 0. 0.0. Three, one, three. Sorry. Right. No problem. There we go. So now we've got to figure out, we know what our KC expression is, right? We know that KC is equal to 2.24. Okay. No problems with that. We've got the initial, everything set up. It's all ready to go. And everybody knows that we're going to have to either, you know, subtract 2x here, then plus x here, plus x here, or, or, what if it's, you know, what if it's plus 2x here and minus that, you know, how are we going to figure that out? I want to know, is this reaction going to shift to the left or the right? How would I determine that? Who could answer that for me? Yeah, Brogan, a good, I was going to say one word answer. Brogan, that's a good one letter answer, right? Brogan just says, find QC, right? And then compare QC to KC. Couldn't agree more. So let's do it. Um, and so my Q, um, I guess I'll use the blue pen again. So QC is going to be equal to 0 0.0625 squared divided by 0 0.0313 squared. And that gives you, oh, come on, 0 0.0625 square it divided by 0 0.0313 squared, boop, bap. there we go. I got I got 3.987 spinach, spinach. So we'll just say it's um, 4.00. So it means that QC is greater than KC. So if QC is greater than KC, that means my denominator is too big, right? So that means that it's gonna have to shift to the left. My equilibrium is gonna shift towards the left. Now, if it's shifting towards the left, we've seen that twice already, or maybe three times already today. Okay, so if it's shifting towards the left, that means I'm going to gain 2x here, I'm going to lose x here, and I'm going to lose x there. All right, again, not every time is it going to be losing reactants and gaining products. Sometimes reactions shift towards the reactants. So equilibrium here, we have 0 0.0313 plus 2x. Here we have 0 0.0625, I'm sorry, not plus x, come on, minus x, and here we have 0 0.0625 minus x. Beautiful, right? Here it wasn't as abundantly clear. We didn't start with nothing on one side. So in this case, you really did have to solve for q. At least I did. I wasn't able to do that in my brain, you know, and figure it out that quickly. You Maybe you are, maybe you can, but I, I wouldn't do it that way. Um, so now we're just going to solve for x, right? So let's write down our equilibrium expression. We know that our Kc, 2.24, is going to be equal to 0 0.0625 minus x squared, because there's two of those, right? Divided by 0 0.0313 plus 2x squared. Now, you got an option here. You can solve the polynomial or you can do what? Who could tell me what my next step would be if I want to make my life a little easier? What would I do if I want to make my life a little cinchier? Exactly. So all my students are taking, saying, just Mr. Dion, make your life easier. Square, take the square root of this side and take the square root of that side. While you were, while you were typing it down, I wrote down the square root of 2.24, which is 1.50. So now 1.50 is equal to 0 0.0625 minus x divided by 0 0.0313 plus 2x. Now I have no polynomial to solve. It's My life is good. I, and I simplified this to 0 0.0468 plus 3x. 
um, is equal to 0 0.0625 minus x. And then I got that 4x is equal to 0 0.0157. Divide that by 4, divide that by 4, and you get that x is equal to come on, equal 0 0.00393 molar. Well, it's asking us to determine the concentration of everything when equilibrium has been established. So let's do that. The concentration of A is going to be equal to 0 0.0313 molar plus 2 times 0 0.00393 molar. I know you guys could probably do these way faster than me. And I did it already, and I ended up with 0 0.0392 molar. And then you do the same thing for B. You take 0 0.0625, you subtract. 0 0.00393, and you get that the concentration of B and the concentration of C are identical. They are equal to 0 0.0586 molar, like that. Okay, there's the concentration of everything at equilibrium. I mean, if you wanted to check it, you can. You know, if you're in an exam and you feel like you got enough time, you would just say, um, 0 0.0586 squared. So you take 0 0.0586 and you square that and you divide it by 0 0.0392 squared divided by 0 0.0392 squared. And you end up with 2.23 is what I got. Close enough for jazz, right? There we go. Bada boom, bada bing. Question 29 in the hatch, another one, another one for the books, for our section, right? The best section, right? Okie doke. Give me a thumbs up and follow me on that one. Okay. Well, remember we have an exam coming up. Okay. So I want everybody to continue to keep practicing. We have our exam. Um, after the spring break, but as we say in French, lâche pas, which means, you know, don't let up, <laughs> give it, give it. Okay, let's try some of these extra problems. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do here. Since I didn't leave myself enough room to solve this one, I'm going to let you read the first one while I just try to fix this document. So we're going to try to do, shoot, do we have room? We're going to try to do question one, two, and... I think we'll have time to try question three. Why don't we try a couple more? Who wants to just work on this? We'll do question one, two, and three. And then if we have five minutes left, I'll lecture about acids. All right. Yeah, there's two spring breaks. Yeah, man, two spring breaks. Think about it. Just give me a second, and I'm going to um, give myself a little bit more room for this question number one here, and then we'll take a look at it as a group. So just give me probably two or three minutes here and I'll get it set up. Set up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Number two.
Okay, let me go back here. Okay, here we go. All right, can everybody see my screen now? It says, um, question number one. Yes. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the feedback. Good. I don't know why I made these questions so wide, you know, with the iPad, it doesn't, they don't always fit on the screen. Anyhow, you can kind of see the whole question here. Let's, so let's take a look at, these are extra problems. You know, um, I recommend giving them all the college try, just give them a shot. Good, good problems. I've, I've vetted all of them at one point in my life. So uh, let's take a look at this one here. It says to determine the equilibrium constant for this gas phase reaction. So you have one mole of nitrogen, in the gaseous phase, plus three moles of hydrogen in the gaseous phase produces two moles of ammonia. Again, it's a gas. You've got 0.326 moles of hydrogen, 0.439 moles of nitrogen, and you mix them in a one liter vessel. The system was found to contain a total of, at equilibrium, sorry, the system was found to contain a total of 0.657 moles of gas. What's the KC? Assuming the temperature is constant, calculate the value of KC for this other reaction based off of your answers in part A. Well, let's write down what we know and see if we can figure it out. And I think we can. Uh, let's start by running up the balanced equation. Since it's cut off anyway, so you have one mole of nitrogen plus three moles of hydrogen gas, and that is in equilibrium with the two moles of ammonia gas. And we know that initially we started with zero point 439 moles of nitrogen and 0.326 moles of hydrogen, and we have no ammonia. So what kind of thing do you think is going to happen during the change? Is the equilibrium going to shift towards the right or towards the left? Yeah, you're all exactly right, okay? In this case, it's our first case today, I think, where our reaction shifts towards the products, right? So that means we're gonna lose X amount of nitrogen. We're gonna lose three times as much hydrogen because the ratio is one to three. And then we're gonna gain twice as much nit or ammonia, sorry, as we do nitrogen because the stoichiometric ratio of nitrogen to ammonia is one to two. So there we go, we've got our change. And now we can write our, our equilibrium expression. So we got equilibrium is gonna be equal to zero point, um, Four three nine. Um, subtract x zero point three two six moles. Subtract three x, and I've got two uh, x over here. Okay. Now I'm leaving everything in moles, and I'll tell you why. Is because they tell me that at equilibrium, it's found to have a total of six point seven moles of gas. So that means that if I add up this plus this plus this, it should equal 0 0.657 moles, right? That's told to me is if I add up everything at equilibrium, I'm going to equal 6.57 moles. So now I can solve for X, not a polynomial. I'm going to say, therefore, I have 0 0.439 minus X plus 0 0.326 minus 3x, I'm leaving my units out just to be quick here, uh, plus 2x is equal to 0 0.657 moles. All right, I simplified that to 0 0.439 minus x plus 0 0.326 minus 3x plus 2x. Just getting rid of the brackets. It's not really much of a simplification, is it? Anyhow, is equal to um, 0 0.6 five, seven moles. You simplify that a little bit further. So I got two X is equal to 0 
um, 108. So divide that by two, and you get the X is equal to 0 0.0540 moles. Okay, that's what my X is equal to. Now I can figure out my equilibrium concentrations of my nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia. So I still have more work to do with respect to the equilibrium. I have 0 0.439 moles, subtract 0 0.0540 moles. That means that at equilibrium, I have 0 0.385 moles. But since the volume is one liter, what happens when you take 0.385 moles and you divide it by one liter? You get 0.385 molar. So whoever put this question together, and it wasn't me, I took it from another book, okay, not our book. Um, they're throwing us a bone just by making it simple. So I'm going to cross off moles, and I'm just going to put molar to make my life a little simpler. So that's for my hydrogen, or sorry, for my nitrogen, for my hydrogen, I take 0.326. I subtract three times 0 0.0540. So I already went ahead and did that. And you end up with um, your hydrogen as being 0 0.164 molar. And your nitrogen is two times this. So two times, I just want to double check my cat. 0 0.054 times two. You end up with 0 0.108. 0 0.108 molar. So here we go. I have my equilibrium concentration of nitrogen, hydrogen and ammonia give me a thumbs up if you're like i got you so far mr dion you know just doing a little math i'd say the major leap in this problem you know that kind of makes it different than the other problems is being able to figure out this part right here and i freely admit that you know is this part right here you have to understand that when you tally up everything that you have at equilibrium it should equal 0.657 i know I know that if I gave anybody who's hearing the sound of my voice this equation and I said, solve it for X, you would all nail it, okay? You'd all get 100%. It's interpreting the problems that's challenging in this class, right? Being able to interpret, you know, what do I add? What do I subtract? Things like that. So now we have our equilibrium expression, um, or I didn't write that down, but we have our equilibrium concentrations, and we can plug those into the equilibrium expression, which I could have written at the beginning. Kc is equal to... Concentration of ammonia squared divided by the concentration of N2 times the concentration of hydrogen cubed. So we'll plug that in here. So I'll say Kc is equal to 0 0.108 squared divided by, what's my nitrogen? Is 0 0.385 times 0 0.164, no, cubed, cubed, yeah, there we go. And you punch all that spinach into your calculator. Make sure you knew, know how to use your calculator. I recommend using the same calculator for everything in this class. Get really strong with one of them. And um, when you punch all that into your calculator, you end up with, I got 6.87. Did anybody else get that? 6.87 is a KC. That's something I don't ask you guys a lot. Did you guys get the same answer as me? <laughs> I didn't look at the solutions for this one. I guess I could. Did anybody get this? 6.87? Okay. That's what I got. Okay, good. You, I was one second away from looking it up. Okay, thanks. All right. Sometimes it's nice to look at the answers. Sometimes it's nice to just say, hey, can I step out on faith here? Did I do it right? Okay. So let's solve the second part. And I'm going to... I'm going to copy this here, just my, oops, I'm going to copy my equilibrium expression, okay? So copy, and I'm going to paste it down here, paste, there we go. And we know from the last part, part A, we know that our KC was equal to 6.87, or at least that's me and what, what one other student got, to, to, to ain't bad. Okay, so it's asking us to calculate the KC for this reaction. It's one mole of ammonia decomposes or is in equilibrium with one half of a mole of nitrogen gas plus three over two um, moles of hydrogen gas. So one and a half moles of hydrogen gas. Okay, so what did we do here? Not only did we reverse the reaction, so reaction 
is reversed, right? So I switched it, I just flipped it around. So that means that if this is my KC, my KC prime is what I'll call it, is gonna be equal to one over the original KC. What else did I do besides reverse it? Can anybody tell me? I did something else besides reverse it. Exactly. Thanks, Jamil. I divided it by two. He says, have it, right? So divide, divide by two. You follow me here, people? Like if you take this whole thing and you divide it by two, you'd get one, one divided by two is a half, three over two is three over two, and two over two is one. Okay, so I reversed it and I divided it by two. I went over these rules with you in class. So when you reverse it, you take the reciprocal. And if you divide by two, so that's like multiplying by a half, okay? So that's multiply by one half. Then you take this whole thing and you take it to the power of a half. If you don't follow me, jeepers, I'd have to go back to see where those rules were. But I just want to be sure that my students know. So here we go. It's slide 32, okay, where we looked at these rules, right? If you reverse it, you take the reciprocal. And if the reaction is multiplied by a factor, in this case, it was a half, you take the KC and put it to that power. So we're applying, we're applying both of these rules in this problem. Let's go back. Okay, so what slide was it? Slide, slide 32, if you need to go back and look over the rules. So we have one over 6.87. Then we take the square root of that. And we end up with, let me just check here, 6.87. I got 0 0.382 as being equal to my KC prime. Anybody get that? All right, there we go. Slide 32 or maybe it's slide 28, depending on which deck you have. I changed them after. You know, I change them once in a while if I add something or remove something. Anyhow, rules are in there. All right, let me give you a heads up to my students who have looked at an ACS study guide before. Is anybody here? Um, is anybody here? Maybe I shouldn't ask the question. Let me just put it this way. Do you guys know what an ACS study guide is? Has anybody heard of the ACS study guide? So American Chemical Society study guide. Okay. If you have heard of it, you well, then you know everything you need to know. If you haven't heard of it, so Brogan, if anybody hasn't heard of it, let me show you. Joel says he owns one. Let's see here. Where are my students at? Stop presenting. Now, I have one in my office somewhere. I don't know where I put it. Uh, that's organic. General chemistry. I have one here. I don't know if it's the, the newest one, but oops, go to application. But this is what an ACS study guide looks like. It's a book that's put out by the American Chemical Society, and it has all of the content for general chemistry one. And oh, here's mine. Here it is. It's way back here on the shelf. It has questions for all the content in general chemistry one and general chemistry too, okay? And I recommend, you know, buying one, even if we don't write the ACS exam. So historically, what we did at UCCS is, and I'm gonna answer your question, Autumn, is that historically, we always gave the ACS final to our students. The reason why is it's a standardized exam and it would suck if you took two semesters of general chemistry at UCCS, then you went to another university and you couldn't do diddly squat compared to their students. No, no, no. I trained my students, that's you guys, so that you are at the same level as anybody in this country who has taken general chemistry. So that's why we use this as a standard. Now you can buy this on the internet. I don't know, maybe my students can chime in for how much it is. I think it's maybe $25, okay? Something along that lines. I can post the link in the announcements if you want for you know where you can order this. Um, now, Autumn says, um, will this be our final this semester? And the answer is, right now, Autumn, I am leaning towards no. 
And the reason why is because um, it, there's special rules that I have to abide by if I want to give you the ACS final. So I'm just probably not going to use it. I might. I could change my mind, you know, if, if somebody else in the department really pushes for it. So you might be asking, if we're not going to write the ACS final, why the hell are you talking about this, Mr. Dion? Because this study guide is such a great resource for you guys, especially my students, and I have many of you I know, who want to write a standardized test in the future that might involve general chemistry. Some of you might want to go to medical school or dental school or, or pharmacy school or whatever, okay? In that case, this would be a great resource for review. Right? It has all the content from General Chemistry 1 and General Chemistry 2. And I don't know about you, but maybe if you study this and you write the standardized exam two years from now, you might forget a little bit. So this would be a great tool for that. I went through it over the holiday and I solved all the problems for General Chemistry 1 and General, no, just for General Chemistry 2 for this class. So if anybody has it and they're struggling with a problem in it, if you're just trying them for fun, um, just reach out to me and I can probably help you out and just, you know, forward you the solution or something like that. Anyhow, so again, a wonderful, wonderful resource. Goes over a review. It's kind of like a Cole's Notes, right? But it's got great questions. And if you're wondering, like, why are you bringing this up now at the end of a class, you know, in chapter 13? The reason why is this. Let me show you something. So I'm going to share my screen with you again. And when I was going over the problems over the holidays, you know, they love to ask questions about your understanding, okay? Do you understand what the hell is going on? And do you know the rules, right? The little nuances. And so this kind of question here, where you're given a KC and then asked to determine the KC for the reaction if it's manipulated, that is a classic ACS type question, you know, where they're like, do you understand the rules? Can you apply them? Anyhow, something to think about. Again, uh, if I forget, because I have a meeting right after this class, if I forget, somebody shoot me an email and I'll put a link as to where you can buy it. Katie says you can buy it on Amazon for 24 bucks. It's not bad. You can even share one with a friend. But again, I, I think it's a good idea to own one. You know, you already spent, you know, two semesters in, in general chemistry. It's a good idea. All right. Enough about that. Let's try question number two. Uh, let's see here. What's this one about? Uh, decomp. Okay, so consider the decomposition of ammonium carbamate. Man, this keeps showing up. At 40 degrees Celsius, 5 grams of ammonium carbamate is placed in a 10 liter vessel and allowed to reach equilibrium. Okay, good. At equilibrium, you've got 1.33 grams of ammonium carbamate left over. Assume the reaction is at constant temperature. What's Kc and what's Kp? This one's not that bad. Let's see if we can build on our confidence and just Go ahead and solve this thing. So let's start out by writing down our balanced equation. So we've got ammonium carbamate, which we discussed today is a solid. And that's in equilibrium with two moles of ammonia, which is a gas, and one mole of CO2, which is also a gas. If I was going to write a Kc expression for this right away, okay, my Kc is going to be equal to the concentration of my ammonia squared times the concentration of my CO2, right? That's my KC expression. Ammonium carbamate doesn't factor into it because ammonium carbamate is a solid. However, initially, it's all I start out with. I only have 5.00 grams of this, right? Nothing else, okay? I've got zero ammonia and zero carbon, carbon dioxide. Could anybody tell me, will this equilibrium shift to the left or to the right? And it is not a trick. Yeah, to, to the right, because I only have starting material. I only have reactants, so it's going to have to shift towards the right-hand side. Okay, there we go. By the way, thanks, um, uh, Katie, or whoever put the link in there for the study guide. Great. Okay, so that means our change. We're going to lose some amount of X. We're going to gain twice as much ammonia because the stoichiometric coefficient is 2. And we're going to gain some X over here. It's telling us that at equilibrium, we've got 1.33 grams of this 
In here, we've got 2x. In here, we've got x. All right, 0 plus 2x is 2x. 0 plus x is x. Okay. Well, can we determine what x is? Yeah, we can determine what x is over here. If we have 5.00 grams, subtract x is equal to 1.33 grams. That means the x is going to be equal to 5.00 grams, subtract 1.33 grams. And that means that my x is going to be equal to 3 3 so we're going to 3.67 moles okay um there we go no 3.67 sorry you guys uh 3.67 grams i want to convert that to the number of moles i'm given the molar mass of my ammonium carbamate so divided by 78 grams per mole I get 3.67 divided by 78 is equal to 0 0.047. I'm going to add an extra sig fig here. So 471 moles. Okay. Um, so there we go. So that's our x. Um, so that means that 2 times x is going to be equal to, so let's rewrite this. The equilibrium, we've got 1.33 grams of this. We've got two times our x, which is 0 0.0471. So two times 0 0.04 times two is equal to 0, 0 0.0941 moles of ammonia. And we've got 0 0.0471 moles of carbon dioxide. Now, again, if we're going to calculate our Kc, the only thing we're interested in is the concentration of these two. We have the number of moles of each, and we have the volume of the container of the vessel, which is 10 liters. So I'm going to divide both of these by 10.0 liters, 10.0 liters, and I get that at equilibrium, again, I have 1.33 grams of this. I've got um, 0 0.00941 molar here, and I've got 0 0.0, no, 0, 0.0. 0471 molar here. And then to figure out what my KC is, I know I'm kind of running out of space on this slide, so I'm going to write it in here. Okay, I'll make myself a space here to do some of the math. So determine my KC. It's going to be equal to the concentration of my ammonia, 0 0.00941 squared times 0 0.00471. Everybody give it a try. I'm going to try it. So squared times 0 0.00471. I'm going to put this in scientific notation. I get 4.17 4 times 10 to the negative 5. Did anybody else get that? Maybe I should just save my breath. Is anybody trying these along with me? I hope so. Anyhow, there's my KC. And uh, to solve for the KP, so I've got my KC, so KC is equal to 4.17 times 10 to the negative 5. So my KP, KP is going to be equal to KC times RT to the delta N. My delta N is equal to 3, right? I have 3 moles of gas and I have 0 over here. So I get that my KP is equal to 4.17 times 10 to the negative 5. I'm running out of time here, aren't I? Times uh, 8.3. Come on, times 8.314 times my temperature. It's 40 degrees Celsius. So 40 plus 273, so that's um, 313 Kelvin. So 313 all to the power of three. So let's see here. I got eight point, come on, 8.314 times 313 equals that cubit multiplied by 4.17 times 10 to the negative five. 
punch all that spinach into your calculator. And we end up with our KP is equal to 0 0.0071, okay, is what I had written down. And, you know, here we go. So there's our KP. All right. The whole thing that threw the sig figs off for me, you guys, is that um, the molar mass has only got two sig figs. If I was to put this in an exam, I would be sure to put three sig figs there so that everything would have three sig figs. Anyhow, close enough. All right. Well, we took the whole day and practiced equilibria. So hopefully that builds up your confidence a little more. You know, and if you're like, I don't feel confident, Mr. Dion. Well, hopefully then it showed you where your weaknesses are and what you need to work on.